In today's lesson, we're looking at imagery and a little bit on of figurative language. And then we will be looking at The Tempest or Act 1, Scene 1 of The Tempest. Has anyone studied The Tempest before? Is it new to you? You can pop it in the comments just so that I know levels of understanding of the play. Um, all good if you've never seen, seen it, heard of it anything that's totally fine we're starting from the beginning okay so the first thing that I wanted to talk about was recapping last week we looked at layers of symbolism that was the reading for this week um, we're up to this is step six of the literary analysis process um, and it's an important aspect of of a text when we're analyzing it is considering I'm just going to scroll back to the beginning considering the different aspects of symbolism and so when we're looking at the tempest it's particularly important as well um, as it says here weather such as rain sunshine or fog can symbolize mood or atmosphere reflecting the emotional or psychological state of characters or events um, and that's what we've got so the tempest is a storm the opening scene of the tempest is quite literally a storm so we've got uh, you know a physical tempest happening we've got a ship being thrown around we've got people on board the boat who are struggling for survival um, and so this this becomes a quite a potent symbol as well we've got um, the breakdown of order the, the disintegration of social order on on the boat um, we've got you know a, a situation where of political and social upheaval is also being symbolized through the storm. Um, and we also have this fantastical element that comes through in um, through the storm as well. As you, you'll notice that when we read it, we don't actually meet Prospero, the main character yet, but we find out in the later scenes that he has actually conjured this storm. So he is a magician and, and he has actually created this storm as an act of vengeance. So we will also look at that as well. Um, and, you know, and how this, the storm also becomes a symbol of his, his power <clears throat> and his authority, his ability to sort of manipulate nature to, to suit his will. Um, we will also look at a few other symbols. So we've got the ship itself as a microcosm of society. You'll notice quite quickly that there are, there's a breakdown of social hierarchy aboard the ship. Um, and we have a lot of different personalities, people from different classes, um, you know, and a lot of class conflict happening on board because we have the bosun or it says boatswain, but it, apparently it's um, also pronounced bosun um, is, is um, you know, he's a, he's a lower, um, lower in the social standing, the social hierarchy, but he is very much, um, you know, coming back at the more high ranking officials, including the king, because he's ultimately the one that has the, the skills and the knowledge to save them from this deadly storm. So he's sort of, you know, ordering them around and they can't quite believe that such a lowly person would dare to speak to them in that way, because in any other social context, um, that would not fly. Um, so there's a few interesting dynamics there. Um, another aspect um, I mentioned Prospero's magic, so that's another really strong symbol of authority and dominance um, throughout the play. It's not so much in the opening scene, but, I mean, the storm itself is conjured by Prospero. Um, and the other one, we've got the mariners. We've got the, the seamen, and these people on board the boat can also represent every man and sort of this, um, the human condition as a whole. It's sort of these, these men become symbolic of the human struggle for survival, you know, amidst inevitable chaos. So we'll, we'll have a look at how some of those symbols play out. So that was sort of what I wanted to pinpoint, um, you know, off the back of last week's lesson. So let's now have a look at, I'll introduce you to the next step um, in the process, step seven, and we're going to have a little bit of a look at imagery. So in this reading, this is not this act one scene one of the tempest is not so much of an image driven text so ideally i would have chosen something that was a little bit more um laden with imagery this is a more i would say an action driven text or you know moment of the text um but have a read through this next week's text will be more image driven um so have a read through this in preparation for next week's lesson um and i've just sort of broken down the different forms of imagery so we've got visual image there. Um, there is a little bit of visual imagery in, in this first scene of the Tempest. There is indeed some auditory imagery because we do get the sounds of the storm, people screaming. So that's probably the most prominent one. 
Um, so have a read through that. I've got some examples there um, from Harry Potter and the Great Gatsby, olfactory imagery appealing to a sen the sense of smell, gustatory, tactile imagery, and kinesthetic, so imagery that captures movement. So I would say if anything in this opening scene, we'll, we will probably see some of that as well. Um, and then also organic imagery, so natural imagery. So see, also you can pay attention to see if there's any uh, any um, descriptive language that is describing this scene of the, of the you know, this turbulent um, storm. You could describe that as organic imagery as well. And what does it capture? And then figurative language. So some figurative language will serve to develop the imagery and, and you know, craft strong, vivid images. Others won't. Um, but techniques like similes, metaphors, personification, hyperbole, symbolism, these can all serve to show rather than tell and to craft those sorts of, you know, engaging images that make a text more image driven. Um, so I've sort of broken down how some of those figurative language devices relate to imagery um, and, and how writers can use them to build stronger images in their writing. So, yeah, have a read through this this week, um, see what you make of it, and then we'll start applying that to a more image driven text next week. Any questions on any of that so far? All good. Okay, let's have a have a look at the opening scene of The Tempest. Um, so let's go. This is stage directions to kick it off. A tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning heard. Enter a shipmaster and a bosun. Master, bosun. Here, master, watch here. Good, speak to the mariners. Fall to, fall to it yearly or we run ourselves aground. Bestir, bestir, he exits. Enter mariners. Bosun. Hi, my heart. Cheerly, cheerly, my heart. Yeah, yeah. Take in the top sail. Tend to the master's whistle. Blow till thou burst thy wind, if room enough. Enter Alonso, Sebastian, Antonio, Ferdinand, Gonzalo, and the others. Alonso. Good bosun, have care. Where's the master? Play the men. Bosun. I pray now, keep below. Where is the master, bosun? Do you not hear him? You mar our labour. Keep your cabins. You do assist the storm. Nay, good, be patient. When the, sea, when the sea is, hence, what cares these roarers for the name of king? To cabin, silence, trouble us not. Gonzalo, good, yet remember whom thou hast aboard. None that I more love than myself. You are a counsellor. If you can command these elements to silence and work the peace of the present, we will not hand a rope more. Use your authority. If you cannot, give thanks you have lived so long and make yourself ready in your cabin for the mischance of the hour. If it so hap, cheerly, good hearts, out of our way, I say, he exits. Gonzalo, I have great comfort from this fellow. Methinks he hath no drowning mark upon him. His complexion is perfect gallows. Stand fast, good fate to his hanging. Make the rope of his destiny our cable, for our own doth little advantage. If he be not born to be hanged, our case is miserable. He exits with Alonzo, Sebastian, and the other courtiers. Enter Boson. Down with the topmast. Yeah, lower, lower. Bring it, bring her to try with the main course. A cry within. A plague upon this howling. They are louder than the weather or our office. Enter Sebastian, Antonio, and Gonzalo. Yet again, what do you do here? Shall we give over and drown? Have you a mind to sink? A pox on your throat, you bawling, blasphemous, incharitable dog. Work you then. Hang her, hang you, whore son, insolent noisemaker. We are less afraid to be drowned than thou art. Gonzalo, I'll warrant him for drowning, though the ship were no stronger than a nutshell and as leaky as an unstanched wench. Bosun, lay her a hold, a hold. Set her two courses. Off to sea again, lay her off. Enter more mariners, wet. Mariners, all lost. To prayers, to prayers, all lost. Mariners exit. Bosun, what must our mouths be cold? Gonzalo, the king and prince at prayers. Let's assist them, for our case is as theirs. Sebastian, I am out of patience. Antonio, we are merely cheated of our lives by drunkards. This wide-chopped rascal, would thou mice, mightest lie drowning the washing of ten tides? 
though St. Exit's. He'll be hanged yet, though every drop of water swear against it and gape at widest to glut him, a confused noise within. Mercy on us, we split, we split. Farewell, my wife and children. Farewell, brother. We split, we split, we split. Let's all sink with the king. Sebastian, let's take leave of him. He exits with Antonio. Gonzalo, now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground, long heath, brown furs, anything. The wills above be done, but I would fain die a dry death. He exits. Okay, so if any of you would like to read um, the modern translation, I have actually added it, bear with me here, in the course materials. So you'll see um, in it comes up a little bit differently on your end, but I have Act 1, Scene 1 of The Tempest with Modern Translation, which takes you to the Spark Notes, um, No Fear Shakespeare, which is a fantastic resource. I always say to students, there is absolutely no shame whatsoever in reading a modern translation of a Shakespeare play. And that is because it's not the kinds of language that we use these days whatsoever. So feel free to have a look at this version. Um, some of them are not free for all the Shakespeare plays, but a lot of them are. Um, so for The Tempest, it is. So if we have a look through this modern text here, I'm sure you've probably seen this before, but you can read through and just clarify any of the language there. So it just helps with just different words that we don't use in today's day and age. Um, and you can sort of, you know, compare the two. Like, yeah, we don't say Y-A-R-E anymore, um, but it's quickly, quickly. So little things like that. Um, even here, blow till thou burst thy wind, if room enough, blow your heart out storm. So you wouldn't, if you read the original text, you might not straight away pick up on the fact that he's actually, the boatswain there is referring to the um, the storm itself and, and personifying the storm and almost, um, you know, making it a living entity there. So it can help you with clarifying meaning as well and understanding. Even good boatswain have care, where's the master? Be careful, where's the master? Make these men work. Um, and here, um, this you mar our labour, keep your cabins, you do assist the storm. Can't you hear him giving orders? You're getting in the way of our work. Stay in your cabins. You're helping the storm, not us. Little details like that I find helpful, even when you're analysing, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of a different perspective of what you're actually analysing. And I think you get a stronger sense of Gonzalo's patience here. He doesn't seem particularly patient when you read the original text, but even here, don't get wound up, my good man. Um, he's, he's a bit more respectful than the other characters. So I find the modern translation interesting. We get a, a bit of a stronger sense of Gonzalo as somebody that, um, you know, sees the bosun not as somebody lowly, um, but as somebody... Um, you know, who's almost on an equal because he has the, the skills and knowledge that can save them. Um, when the sea is hence, what cares these roarers for the name of the king? Do you think these waves care anything about kings and officials? Um, go to your cabins and be quiet. Don't bother us up here. So, yeah, I just thought I'd read a little section of that because I think it gives you a, a strong sense of the voice as well. Um, so I'll leave that open as well in case there's anything that we're analysing and then I can jump back into this just to clarify if anybody has any questions or anything like that. So let's then come across to the 10-step um, analysis of The Tempest. So... Before we get started, any thoughts on uh, what that opening, what's happening in that opening scene? Is it clear to you or do you want a little bit more of an explanation of what's actually going on and who these people are? Because we have um, the courtiers, we have the king of Naples, we have Alonzo on board who um, addresses the bosun as well. Um, we have people that are of, you know, lots of different ranks and stations in life. And we have, um, you know, as, as I was saying, the symbol of the microcosm, we have a lot of different, different people from different classes. So in a nutshell, we've got the storm, 
the ship is breaking down and we've got arguments breaking out as the bosun and the master struggle to save the ship. We've got people coming up on the top deck, um, you know, trying to, you know, say their two cents and, and wondering what is happening. And the bosun is ordering them back down below deck saying, what are you doing up here? You're stopping us from say, you know, do you want to be saved or not? Um, and then there's just this argument. Um, and so let's take a look at... Um, the context here. Um, any ideas as to what is Shakespeare's context, purpose, intended audience, or the values as evident in the play? Um, if anyone wants to venture their two cents worth, if anyone know anything about Shakespeare's context, but I'm just going to pop a few little notes in here um, based on what I think is what is important, but feel free to drop some ideas into the notes, um, into the comments, please. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about, though, is the idea that um, Shakespeare composed The Tempest during the Age of Exploration. And this was really a period of expansionism and colonial conquest. So people were out exploring the world in ships, looking for new lands, um, you know, and, and discovering new places to colonise. Uh, so it was in the 1600s. So we didn't really have as such conceptions of colonisation back then. Uh, you know, going out and venturing into new lands and colonising them from the British perspective was still very much acceptable and it was a part of their, their quest. Um, Another aspect that I will also mention is Renaissance humanism is relevant if you're going to talk about this play. So this was also a period where people were re-evaluating their beliefs in, in God, in, in religion, and the role that, um, you know, humanity played in their own lives. Um, you know, people were starting to th see themselves as more autonomous beings um, who actually had some, you know, control over their own fates and destinies. Um, so I'll pop that in here. Um, um, renewed interest, or I'll just say interest in um, human autonomy and questioning of religious faith. So a few little contextual details. Um, I will also say religious upheaval. Um, we also had um, the Protestant Reformation. So if you're going to talk about this, maybe do a little bit of research into the Reformation. Um, challenging beliefs in divine providence. redemption and forgiveness. And we see this later in the play as Prospero goes on his quest from power hungry, somebody that wants to wield control over others and seek vengeance uh, because he was usurped, overthrown from his position of Duke of Milan by his brother and exiled and overthrown to the island. So following this opening scene, the ship is shipwrecked and um, these people are cast upon the island where um, Prospero had already been exiled with his daughter Miranda. Um, okay, so just a little backstory there. Um, a little bit about Shakespeare's purpose and intended audience. I would say his audience would have been quite broad. Back in those days, he was his plays were widely performed at the Globe, quite a broad audience. Um, I would say part of his purpose as well um, was a, definitely a critique um, of power and authority and a questioning of beliefs, belief in the great chain of being or the natural order. So in these times as well, people believed in the great chain of being, which from right up to, you know, God and the angels in the sky through, you know, who supposedly chose who was going to rule on, on earth, um, you know, in the humans. So we had the monarch was de decided or determined by God and then humans sort of fell into the social hierarchy below, um, you know, in, in a, 
below the the more high ranking right down to um, actors were quite low on the social hierarchy back then believe it or not down to you know animals insects and inan inanimate objects um, and so in a lot of Shakespeare's plays we see that there is some kind of disruption to this social order and that happens before this play even starts with um, Prospero, the Duke of Milan, being overthrown. That's a disruption to the natural order. Um, and then we have this, the chaos of the storm, um, you know, as a symbol of, of uh, fracturing of, of order as well. Um, we have this tension between uh, order and chaos. So I think part of it as well is to, um, you know, prompt um, audiences to consider the conflict between order and chaos as um, inevitable, an inevitable aspect of human experience. Yeah, so you can go in and fill more of that in. Um, values, any idea of what values Shakespeare is upholding or rejecting in this play? Any ideas? And this can link to the big ideas as well that we'll discuss shortly. What does it seem like he's for and against? Or you could talk about different characters in the play. What are they potentially for or against as well? You can feel free to pop it into the comments. I will put a few ideas in while I get your input. Um, I think some of the, the values that he's upholding is certainly um, autonomy agency, self-determination, uh, this idea that human beings can take matters into their own hands and can affect their fate. Um, and I think we see this when, you know, we've got certain characters even in the opening scene who um, demonstrate um, agency, uh, like the bosun. The bosun. And we, then we have also people who sort of seem resigned to their fate. To their fate and sort of go, oh, we're going to go down, the, we're down with the ship. Uh, we'd better die with our king. That's what's going to happen. We'd better say our prayers. They're putting their faith in, in God at that time. Um, and whereas we've got people who... Um, you know, actively trying to intervene in that course of events. Um, and so we have that tension between autonomy, agency and self-determination and potentially a rejection of some of these other values um, where we see um, fate and destiny as controlling forces. And this is really shaped by Renaissance humanism as well in people's lives. Okay, a few other aspects as well that I think come into the values is um, whilst there is an upholding, the play certainly upholds this idea of social hierarchies and power, power structures. Um, um, however, you know, we see them at play. However, um, Shakespeare is also really uh, revealing how destructive they are to human relationships. Um, you know, these sorts of social hierarchies are really the, the catalyst for conflict. Um, so I think he's really rejecting the abuse of power through this play and even from the opening scene. Okay, and I think then in particularly as we see the play unfold, uh, he's definitely rejecting um, negative values like vengeance um, in and abuse of power, power hungry, controlling people um, in favor of redemption, um, forgiveness, and social harmony. Uh, and we definitely see the restoration of order. 
And these will start to come into uh, when we start analysing this scene of the play as well. Okay, so big ideas. Does anybody have any ideas about the ideas? And what, what do you think so far from what you've read? If you had to choose one big idea, what do you think this opening scene is about based on what I've told you? If you had to choose something. I'm going to start from the bottom of my list and work my way up. Um, but please drop something in the comments. Or my, hang on, I don't have the chat open. Questioning authority. Um, oh, that was from earlier. I'm going to leave that chat open. It was closed and I didn't get notified. Okay. Big ideas. Yeah, I'm going to pop that. Power and authority. Questioning authority. Borrowing Michael's idea from earlier. Yeah. Um, deciding whether to control your fate or let someone else do it for you. Thank you, Michael. So that's that fate versus self-determination. You can put it down to there. Absolutely. One of the other aspects that I really like about this opening scene as well is how it really starts to give us a glimpse into um, the class division and social hierarchy. As a catalyst for conflict, as I said just before. Um, yeah, division based on class and status. We also see as well nature versus civilization. Um, and guess what prevails? Uh, we see nature as the ultimate social leveler. Yeah. Uh, we see that even in the face of, um, you know, the unpredictable world of nature, even people that are, you know, kings and nobles in human society, um, you know, they are faced with the same fate as anybody that is lower ranking. So nature doesn't view, nature it doesn't discriminate. You know, nature will, you know, the same consequences will be available to everybody, no matter what class they're from. So I think that that's a big part of it as well. And as the play unfolds, we also see that, um, you know, nature affords many opportunities for disrupting social order. Uh, and when we come to textual form, I will elaborate more on that because we have, yes, it's a tragic comedy and we see conventions of both, but it's also a pastoral comedy. And so I will break down a little bit more about the nature versus civilization when I talk about that court versus country um, aspect that comes into pastoral comedies as well, particularly Shakespearean ones. Um, the other um, aspects that I just wanted to put in there that you can form big ideas around um, are this idea of resistance and defiance of social expectations. That's a big one you could look at. Um, and then fate versus self-determination. I'm just going to pop autonomy in there. Yeah, so there's a few ideas that you can use. So let's just have a quick look at the form. Um, it's a tragedy comedy. Yes, that will become more evident later as well. We do have, I mean, right from the start in this opening scene, we have the potential for tragedy, don't we? These people think that they're losing their lives. Um, the ship's going down. And so we think, okay, these people, they're saying goodbye to their family. Um, you know, we have elements of tragedy potentially unfolding in the opening scene. Um, however, we also have elements of comedy as well. Um, there's a lot of those derogatory insults being bandied around. Um, you know, we have the comic relief um, there of, you know, that sort of really uh, bawdy 
um, dialogue where people are, you know, teasing each other and and using quite dramatic insults. Um, so that sort of breaks up the tension as well and even the back chat of the bosun as well. Um, so there are definitely comedic elements in this opening one. And, and if you actually read the modern translation, I won't go into it, but some of those insults are pretty damning as well. There's a, and even when they refer to the boat um, and how it's leaking, like really quite disgusting references that I'm not going to translate for you right now, but yeah, feel free to read it. Um, but that would have been humorous for the audience. So I'm just going to put, you know, bawdy humor, um, derogatory insults and the Elizabethan audience would have been very aware of the fact that this was a lowly um, person speaking back to the king and the and the officials as well so that would have had a humorous um, sort of you know treasonous quality to it that they probably would have found a little bit enthralling um, but this is what I wanted to have a quick look at before we go into the specific analyzing of key passages from the scene so the idea of a pastoral comedy quite often in a pastoral comedy you have um, you know, you have the city um, or the court versus, I can't type again, um, the country or the natural world. Uh, so this is set up quite nicely in the play. We have the world of the Milan court, um, which is a world of, you know, politics where and, and you know, social um, rules and regulations that people need to follow, you know, quite rigid social norms. And then we have the island, which is a place where, um, you know, Prospero is the colonising figure. He has been exiled there and he is... Um, you know, there's, there's the savage Caliban, the native that lives on the island and Prospero has taken it upon himself to start educating and civilising this, um, this native resident of the island, inhabitant of the island. Um, and so we have on the island the breaking down of those rules and regulations and um, the attempts of those on board the island who are living on the island, Gonzalo later as well, to reimagine a new form of of civilization where humans have greater freedom and um, way less politics and people have more agency and, and less class division and conflict that comes from that. And so we see that happen a lot in, in pastoral comedies. Um, there's a, what's, oh, I'll pop it in the comments. There's another key example that I want to, it's not coming to my mind right now. What's it called? Not the Merchant of Venice. No, it, it'll come back to me. It's okay. But yeah, it's quite a common recurring theme in these kinds of, in Shakespeare's comedies as well. People leave the, the city, the confines of the city life, the court, and then they venture out into the countryside and they stumble upon more harmonious relationships and, and identities than they were able to have in, in, in the city. Um, so I'll just say nature affords more harmonious relationships and more authentic identities than individuals can find in um in the in you know in the city yeah so city versus country is a big one as well um okay let's take a look at some of these other elements so Language style, I'm going to skip through these quite quickly because I would like to spend a little bit more time on some of those other elements and we'll we'll come back to it. But let's take a look at the language style and the voice of the text here. If we come back to um, The Tempest, the opening scene, any ideas on the language style here? Um, if we're looking at the dialogue, what is the tense? Um, you know, I, I said that it wasn't very uh, image driven, but it is very action driven. How does that happen? What when we're when we're looking at an action driven text, what kinds of language do we see more of? So we might not see so many, you know, images, but we see a lot of different types of words. What are they? Um, let's have a look. So here we have, um, you know, a lot of short, sharp questions and exclamations, bestir, bestir, repetition, that sort of urgency. So we have a little bit of an urgent tone. We have a lot of sharp imperatives. So imperative authoritative language where people are being ordered around, um, you know, and, and 
you know, ordering instructions and saying, do this, do that, go here, go there. Um, and we, what we have when we have that kind of language is also a lot of verbs, verbs, adverbs, doing words. Um, and we also see that a lot of them are in present tense. So we are right here in the present moment with these characters on board the ship in the midst of a storm. Um, so this creates that sense of immediacy and urgency. And it's a great way to capture the audience's attention, particularly because it is an opening scene. So think about that as well when you're analysing this. And it might be good in, you know, the first teal for the body paragraph that you write for this analysis. Um, for this question, I'll just quickly show you the focus question. Um, it might be good to look at that language style and how that ga grabs the audience's attention and creates that sense of urgency and immediacy through the language style. The focus question for this week is, how does the opening scene of Shakespeare's The Tempest establish and explore complex power dynamics? So if we're looking at the language style, um, and let's go to, yeah, this, this scene's good because we've got Alonzo and we have Antonio and the bosun and, and these particular characters, Alonzo and Antonio, don't particularly want to stand for the bosun trying to um, resist their authority. Um, so here you'll notice that um, the bosun in particular, um, a lot of rhetorical questions, do you not hear him? It's it's quite, you know, rude and abrupt tone there. You mar our labour. Um, present tense, short, sharp sentences, imperative language, keep your cabins, you do assist the storm, single clause sentences, um, you know, when the sea is, hence, what cares these roarers for the name of king, another rhetorical question. So these these and these in exclamatory little mini um, orders that he's given, giving to cabin, silence, trouble us not, um, you know, this I think all fuels the depiction of the power dynamics as well. So if we want to look at that in, in this 10 step analysis, um, I would say there's definitely room for analyzing that present tense um, action driven language. Um, there's lots of packed with verbs. Um, and imperative commands. Um, it's authoritative, the tone is often authoritative and commanding, demanding. We have lots of short, sharp um, exclamations and clauses. Um, and this really create immediately or creates a sense of immediacy and urgency quite quickly. Um, the other thing that I will talk about as well is the um, heated dialogue. Um, you have the, you know, lots of sharp retorts. There's a lot of back and forth banter. You don't always get that with dialogue. You know, quite often someone will say their piece, then the other person will say their piece. This is quite fast paced. Um, and that also captures the immediacy of the scene. So these are things that you can talk about as well with how does Shakespeare immediately establish these power dynamics through the style of the language? Um, and these are some of the, the aspects that I would talk about. Um, the voice of the text as well, um, I would say that you can talk about tone here. So I would say commanding um, and authoritative tone. Um Often angry, abusive, um, urgent as well, you can talk about. Um, and I would also say character specific language. Uh, there's, you know, different personalities come through in the language here. Different personalities, people from different classes use different voices really um so you can have a look at how different characters from different backgrounds or social ranks speak as well and how Shakespeare really quickly crafts their own distinctive voice um so that's all I'll say for that but definitely lots you could analyze there particularly for establishing that power dynamic um 
Now, the layers of symbolism and the imagery, um, these are some of the ones that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on. Um, but then I think I would also like to look at um, some of the figurative language as well. So the metaphor, the simile, personification and hyperbole as well, just to give you enough to talk about where if you wanted to, when, when you write your paragraph on this, you can take your pick. So power dynamic wise, um, thinking about that practice, that focus question for this week, um, you would probably want to talk about the symbol of the storm, the, the, the tempest itself. That's something that I think you can talk about. Um, so, and how that's a symbolic of the rupturing of the social order, of order, social order. Um, so upheaval, um, chaos, and turmoil. So that's definitely something you can talk about. There's plenty of quotes that you can use to talk about the chaos as well. And I would also probably talk about the symbol of the ship. Oh gosh, ship as a social microcosm or as a microcosm for society. For society. So we see lots of different backgrounds, social classes there. So definitely you could do a teal on, on symbolism and look at a quote from that just so that you've got the dialogue on one level, you know, that back and forth, the banter and the characterization. Um, you might want to even talk about symbolism first. You could you could talk of introduce the idea of the power. Um, let me just look at this. The power dynamics. You could talk about you could introduce the idea of the symbolism of of the storm, the tempest, as a symbolic of the breakdown or the disruption of social order. And then you can talk about how that disruption of order is taking place where you've got the bosun who is a figure of resistance despite his um, social class, he's speaking back to authority figures um, and then how they respond to that. Um, so you could set that up first with the symbol of the storm, then the, the bosun's language, that, that banter, and then you could potentially also look at um, the, the derogatory dialogue as well, those um, if you wanted to, the the voices of the, um, ironically, I think too, voices of the authority figures are actually the most crude and disrespectful. Um, so here we have people that are supposedly, you know, supposed to be more, I guess, refined and esteemed. Um, and, and ironically, they are the ones that are more crass. Um, uh, so you can also have a look at their derogatory dialogue, their derogatory insults to the bosun and look at how that, they're, they're retaliating. They're trying to say, how dare you speak to us like this? How dare you try to defy our authority and order us around? Who do you think you are? You will be hanged for this. And, um, you know, the bosun's like, well, do you want to live or die? I'm the one with the skills to, to make us live. So you'd better do as you're told. And they really are resistant to this. So it sort of gives us the impression that in this, society of the play um you know we're really going to see people that are going to be trying to cling on to their power and authority at all costs um they don't want anybody to take it out of their hands um and so power is so important to people that they would even risk their own lives in the middle of a storm on a sinking ship um then you know have people undermine their authority so it shows just how important authority is to these people as well um So, yeah, that's definitely something you could analyse for the power dynamics. So coming back, I won't put any of the other aspects of symbolism that I spoke about earlier. I will upload them with the this document with, the, with notes later, um, but have a go of doing the body paragraph first before you read the with notes maybe so you can do some of your own analysis. Um, imagery. So as I said, not overly image driven, but there are a few... Um, images that I want to draw your attention to. So you can talk about um, some of the visual imagery that does depict the storm when you're talking about the symbolism. Um, the storm, um, it's described in the stage directions that open the scene. 
directions. Um, you can talk, you know, the, th the thunder and lightning, waves crashing. Uh, we have a lot of that sort of visual imagery, that tumultuous ocean, the chaos of the storm. Um, another one, I've just got some quotes here. That's why I'm looking over here. I've just got some quotes in front of me that are just there at random, but I'm just scanning to see if there's anything that I think is worthy of mentioning. Um, yeah, I think too visual and auditory, I will say for this auditory imagery. Um yeah, and then there are a few also other stage directions, like a cry within. I wouldn't say so much that would be anything to do with the question, but it's just interesting to think about how there's sounds happening on stage and off stage that are adding to this sense of chaos of the scene as well, um, as well as sort of the, the onomatopoeia, uh, some of the language the, a plague upon this howling, they are louder than the weather or our office. So we've got the bosun there where he says that. I might just type that quote in. I won't type the whole quote, but you've got a plague. This quote here is interesting for the question as well. Upon this howling, they are louder than the weather or our office. So this is after the a cry within so we're hearing people screaming from down below or off stage and the bosun is complaining you know saying oh a plague on their howling you know they're louder than the storm um you know what are they doing um you know people that are obviously you know fearful for their lives um and here we have them and their sort of um distress contrasted with the bosun's pragmatism you know he's being very practical he's a man of action he's just getting the job done and he's got no time or room for people to be overly emotional right now um so also as well you know he's being quite confrontational in saying that as well um confrontational um judgment from the bosun who responds to the situation in a practical, pragmatic way. In contrast to the, the whales from below deck. Um, some of the examples as well that you could talk about, um, I thought it was interesting the way that uh, Gonzalo says about, where he says, his complexion is perfect gallows. Um, this... Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I really have to, I have to leave now. I, I got like training now. And I'm so really yeah, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Me. No right, worries thanks. at all. all Thank good. you so much, miss. I'll try to do the work this week. Yep, sounds good. Okay. You. See you next week, miss. Bye. Bye. Okay. No problem. Uh, yeah, so we've got the Gonzalo here. I have great comfort from this fellow. Methinks he hath no drowning mark upon him. His complexion is perfect gallows. Um, so there you can talk about, if you wanted to, the metaphor. He's basically saying this guy looks like he's not going to drown. He's going to be hanged. Um, and in saying that, have a think about who who is someone that usually is hanged, uh, a criminal. So he's sort of saying this guy looks like a criminal. I'm going to put this here, is perfect gallows. So in his defiance, um, the bosun um, has the appearance, at least in Gonzalo's eyes, of a criminal, um, you know, because nobody really defies. This is a, a very strong defiance of social order um, here. Um, in his defiance of social order, the bosun has the appearance of a criminal. Um, so you could talk about that one. The other one that I think is interesting as well, um, probably wouldn't talk about that in relation to the question. Hyperbole. Yeah, probably the last... I might go to the last section here as well of this scene. Down, plague upon this howling. Ah, oh, this one here. You've got have your mind to sink yet again. Yeah, I might just pop this in and put that in 
under voice because I think that's an important one as well for the bosun. Just giving you some ammunition for this focus question, really. Yet again, what do you hear? Do you have a mind to sink? And another quote that I think you could analyse as well, this one here, a pox on your throat, you bawling, blasphemous, incharitable dog. Yeah, quite strong words, those ones. Oops. And then the last part that I wanted to draw attention to before I touch on the body paragraph structure and introduce that um, is probably this last bit. The repetition here. We've got the repetition of we split, we split, we split. Uh, so there's certain phrases that all lost to prayers, to prayers, all lost, which is said multiple times, which I think really shows the the, um, the, that sort of sense of desperation and doom, um, you know, as the ship's sinking. But then I also think the we split is interesting as well. Um, sort of this refrain that's repeated over and over again, um, which, you know, really also heightens the, the danger of the situation, um, the, that tension and that fear and that very real possibility of the ship breaking apart and sinking. Um, but then also I think what's interesting here, it shows how vulnerable these all these people are um, not just um, you know the the lower ranking people but all of them it's said in unison it's um you know that everyone is saying this a confused noise within and pe they're all saying it's it's inclusive language here so you could analyze that for this question um, the we split we split um, you know this is um, you know, speaking on behalf of all of them, they're all going down. So no matter who they are, again, nature is this social leveler that doesn't discriminate no matter where you're from in society. So that could be something that um, you could talk about. And then it's let's all sink with the king. The king is going down with the ship. They're all going down with the king. Um, you know, there's no saving the king from this just because he is the king. So again, it's that questioning of authority um, and I guess the power structures that human beings in civilizations impose on, on, um, you know, on society to put people in a certain order and rank them according to that. So yeah, there's just a few examples there um, that you can talk about in relation to that question. So let's just have a quick read through before we wrap up um, the this um, example. So the example that I've given here, we've got the topic sentence. So uh, provide a clear and conceptual topic sentence that addresses the focus question and outlines the main idea of the paragraph. So for example, the opening scene of Shakespeare's The Tempest establishes complex power dynamics through the interactions between characters and the hierarchical structure aboard the ship. So you've got room there to write your own topic sentence um, the discussion. So then weave in some of those contextual details, like I spoke about, like I've mentioned, the great chain of being, belief in the natural order, um, this idea that if anybody tries to intervene, that that's, um, you know, going against the natural order, that usurpation and exile and everything that's happened before this storm, um, you know, that's all um, you know, going to bring about social chaos. So the example I've just given here in Shakespeare's time, social hierarchy was a prominent aspect of society with clear distinctions between nobility and commoners governed by belief in the great chain of being. This context is reflected in The Tempest where characters like the bosun and the nobles aboard the ship adhere to their respective positions within the social hierarchy. Just giving some contextual detail there to frame your analysis before you're going to say, you know, this is what, this is how Shakespeare is doing it. This is the why, why is this relevant? Um, you know, what was going on in Shakespeare's time? And then your three teals. So I've got room for those there, but just really explicitly identifying a clear technique. So for example, the heated dialogue, um, <clears throat> the example that I've chosen here for the example, provide a direct quote to support your analysis. For example, the bosun's retort to Antonio do not hear him, you mar our labour, keep your cabins, you do assist the storm, serves as a direct challenge to Antonio's attempt to exert authority. 
and then you explain the effect. So I'll elaborate on that. Explain how the identified technique shapes meaning. So for example, the bosun's defiance disrupts the traditional power structure. His refusal to comply with Antonio's commands demonstrating a subtle shift in power dynamics as he asserts his expertise and authority in managing the ship. And then you can, if you haven't already wrapped up there and you, you think there's more room for some evaluation, then you can offer a brief evaluation of the effectiveness of the technique in conveying Shakespeare's message. So for example, this exchange of dialogue effectively establishes the power dynamics aboard the ship, foreshadowing the conflicts and struggles for control that will unfold throughout the play. And then link it back. If you haven't already by then, just think every teal, I've got to somehow link it back to the question. So if you haven't already done that, then you can find a way um, it doesn't have to be its own sentence, by the way. It can just be, um, you know, half a sentence at the end of your your last bit of evaluation or, or ex explanation of the effect. Conclude the analysis by linking the discussion back to the focus question. So something like, through this exchange, Shakespeare initiates a discourse on power dynamics, engaging the audience in the complexities of social hierarchy and resistance. Um, and then, yeah, have a go there of doing one, two, three teals. So, for example, you could, the first one could be the dialogue, um, you know, how that establishes the power dynamics between people from different classes, um, the language style like we spoke about, or it could be maybe start with the symbolism of the storm there as a symbol of disruption, then go into the dialogue and the tone, um, then potentially the we split, you know, the idea that, no matter who you are, nature doesn't discriminate. Um, so you could just choose three examples there, analyze them in turn using that same teal structure. Doesn't have to be as wordy as this. I'm just explicitly laying out each step just so that you're clear. But one to three sentences max for each teal. Um, I'll probably, if you're going into a fourth sentence, I'd be questioning that. Um, and then concluding statement. Provide a concluding sentence that reinforces the main idea of the paragraph. So, for example, Shakespeare utilises dramatic conventions in the opening scene, avoid listing specific techniques, if you can, in your final sentence of the of the body paragraph, um, of, the, of the Tempest to engage the audience in a discourse on power dynamics, setting the stage for further exploration of authority, resistance, and the complexities of social hierarchy throughout the play. Um, so, yeah, a lot of... Um, ideas there for you to work with, please have a go of answering that question and feel free to upload your responses into the shared Google Doc for feedback as well. Um, any questions on any of that before we wrap up? All good? Oh, let me just check the chat there. No. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Well, we might leave it there for today. If there's no further questions, I think I've given you lots to work with. So the reading task, as I said earlier, is this one on imagery. Have a read through that. Um, have a read through the Tempest, um, all, the, all the materials here. I'll just quickly go back and oh, I've got to scroll right down. There we go. I've got a whole bunch of different materials there for you to read as well, including that modern translation. Um, and then yeah, lots of different analysis there. I've broken down the whole first scene. So please have a read through those materials as well by logging into your Podia portal. Okay. Thank you.